So for everyone, once again, who's joining now, my name is Cecilia Baun. I'm a spatial planner. I've been working on various skills within the Euro Delta and beyond. I've been um, doing my PhD on the cross-border corridor scale from Rotterdam to Geneva in the realm of uh, inland port development and uh, city development along the Rhine Alpine corridor. But I've also gained experience working on a regional level in infrastructure and mobility topics. And I'm currently also working on a local scale implementing new mobility solutions. So I uh, have the ability to ex explain or also uh, join here with a lot of experience on various scales, but I'm very happy to introduce to you these three very interesting speakers that we have on board today. They once again are all joining from different countries and are working in different countries. And we also try in the Euro Delta to always bring together various countries within the Euro Delta, but of course also experts with experiences beyond. So we have a speaker from Germany, the Netherlands and Belgium, each depicting the different scales of action and intervention that we would like to discuss in this topic today. So let's start also with the cross-border cooperation between the Netherlands and Germany in particular focusing on the Euro Delta and in this field of international mobility, very active is Klaas von Staldeuner. He is working for the province of South Holland. He has a lot of experience in cross-border mobility and he will be joining today, I guess, from Rotterdam or Amsterdam, but he will be uh, teaching us about his job at the province of South Holland, giving us uh, a very good input on what it is why it is important for the province of South Holland to discuss and to um, present to us today why cross-border mobility is a crucial job for the province of South Holland. Just before you start class, I just want to share quickly the entire overview of today. One moment before you hit. So uh, just so you know, can you see this? I hope everybody can. Yes. OK, perfect. Just uh, before we go, because I want to introduce every speaker shortly, but this is the entire week of the Next Generation Podium. So yesterday, as I mentioned, it's the Lunch Forum Water Management and Climate Adaptation that took place. Today, we focus on cross-border mobility and infrastructure in, uh, in our second Lunch Forum. Tomorrow, there's a third Lunch Forum for the students and all participants on smart specialization strategies. And at the same time, during these lunch forums, we also have open office days yesterday at the city of Amsterdam. Today, I think with 20 students from Buur in Leuven, we have uh, uh, live participation physically taking place in the Buur office. And tomorrow there will be students participating from Metropole Business Ruhr in Essen. And then on Thursday and Friday, as we had it last year, we have the working conference, which is again online, but two full days with opening ceremony and keynote speakers and of course a closing ceremony with jury representations here once again the open offices so just to introduce to you the two speakers i already started with Klaus von Staldeuner on a cross-border mobility level a rather macro regional scale then we have uh, from germany oliver la who is working at the Institute for uh, Wuppertal Institute for Climate, Environment and Energy, a quite renowned institute based in the Rhineland. He will be focusing on uh, international cooperation and of course also urban living labs that he has been created, but he's I think joining from TU Berlin or from Berlin at the moment because Wuppertal Institute is also very much interconnected with other research institutes and he will be explaining to us what kind of research on urban living labs they have currently uh, project-based research driven projects that will be introduced by these, this Wuppertal Institute of Climate, Environment and Energy. So I'm very interested to hear from Oliver La on a rather research driven approach what we have to offer in mobility and international cooperation. Then we have Michel de Papp who's an urban researcher and designer, part of SWECO. And I think we will hear from him on uh, the um, mobility, um, comprehensive mobilities, which is a term I've never heard before, but I'm very curious to hear what you will have to teach to us about approaches that you have in this specific, very also local approach and design approach, um, project-based research, which I think will be also a, is an application of, of design and mobility 
on an urban scale. But of course, we will try to always look at this also in a regional context and trying to scale it up back again to a cross-border international mobility scale. So I'm very interested in the discussion. And as I mentioned before, please um, put your questions in the chat box and I will pick them up in the discussion and in the course of this lunch forum. So now, class, it's your turn to begin. I'm gonna stop my presentation so you can upload yours. Okay. Share my screen. And just want to share sound. Oh, yes. do you not see it in presentation mode? Yes, you are, but I don't see the first slide. Just go to the next slide. Once again. Yeah. What have I done? <laughs> well, let's start talking and I'll try to find my presentation again. I can also all the wrong it. buttons. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to start uh, with bonjour, uh, guten tag, goedemorgen, of inmiddels goedemiddag, um, because I think we have representatives of all uh, countries in the Euro Delta, at least I hope we have representatives from all Euro Delta countries. Um, so we, we need to be um, international. Uh, we need to use all languages. Um, and that's one of the things I like in um, uh, working on an international uh, or cross-border uh, basis. Um, every day you meet other people and every day you meet other people from other countries. Um, and uh, as Cecilia already mentioned, uh, the corridor perspective um, is uh, running from Rotterdam or the port of Antwerp towards Basel and even Genoa. So um, in other presentations, um, I sometimes start with Italian or even Polish because um, we have some um, uh, people in the European Union who are very active in our, uh, for that part. Um, but for now, it's particularly easy. It's only uh, French, um, uh, Dutch, Belgian uh, and German. But first, um, it's, I'm a man, it's difficult to find my presentation and talk to you at the same time. I just uh, put it up. I think you can see it now. Can you see it? Then let's see, where are we? Yes, thank you very much, Cecilia. Um, so uh, I would like to give you a short introduction on cross-border mobility from the perspective of South Holland uh, uh, as part of your um, uh, uh, meetings of this week as, uh, in, in favor of this lunch. And normally I would have to explain what is the Euro Delta, uh, but I'm very happy uh, so that I can skip this today. It's very easy. I don't have to tell you about the economic powerhouses uh, we have in Belgium, uh, north of France, the Netherlands and Germany, or the importance of um, uh, the multimodal network. Um, we, you can see on the map right here. Um, and um, starting with uh, my own focus point uh, for the province of South Holland, the Euro Delta is a very important region. Um, uh, and one of the uh, most important things we are working on is on um, transport uh, from the ports on the seaside, uh, uh, inland transport to uh, the rest of Europe. But I will uh, explain you uh, bit by bit during this presentation. Um, so, um, you can see, uh, if you want to, uh, uh, can you all see my background? I will go away a little bit. Who of you is familiar with this background? Uh, could you put in the chat if you know it or if you are not familiar with it? I'm just fading a little bit. Because these are the corridors. Of course, Emma, you know the map. <laughs> Thank you very much from The Hague. Um, it's the 10 team um, map indeed. Uh, and um, as you look very close, can see very closely, um, I have to here, England is still part of it. So if you see this map with England, uh, uh, the United Kingdom on it and um, uh, colored lines on it, then you should know that it's an old map. Um, 
uh, we are uh, the European Commission is making a new one because of the Brexit. Um, and no, Samuel, it's not a high speed map. These are the nine corridors, transport corridors that the European Commission has drawn uh, over the whole of Europe from the south of Spain towards the north of um, uh, Sweden and um, uh, Finland, uh, and even into uh, Greece um, and uh, Romania. These are the most important transport corridor lines they have drawn and in which you can get European funding for all sorts of projects from pilots for uh, new parts of the corridor, multimodal, of course, uh, or um, um, for uh, sustainable uh, projects uh, in this uh, matter, uh, which is, of course, one of the important uh, aims for the European Commission. So enough about the map behind me, uh, which is the 10T um, corridor map, as I just uh, explained. Um, Let's first start with a short introduction to Zuid-Holland because um, I'm not sure if you are all familiar with um, this um, province uh, we have in the Netherlands. The red part, uh, as you see now, is uh, Zuid-Holland. Um, uh, and we have 12 of these regions, provinces uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, I have put in some figures uh, on uh, the, the economic impact of Zuid-Holland uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, and, you can see we have almost um, uh, more than 20% of the national uh, product of the Netherlands comes from Zuid-Holland. And you can imagine the port of Rotterdam and the uh, Greenport West Holland, uh, the greenhouse uh, area, are very important for that part. Um, and we're very good at um, uh, shifting goods from here to the rest of the Netherlands and uh, beyond. Um, so we have a very big um, part of the Dutch economy uh, in our region um, and a lot of inhabitants as well. But if you compare it to the Euro Delta, we're just fairly small. Um, so uh, we're happy to be part of a, um, um, a bigger region. Next slide, please. And a short introduction to the, um, uh, the, 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 the way we work in Netherlands. I'm in the middle. I work for a province. We're good at spatial planning. Uh, uh, in other parts of the program, you will meet Helmut Teule. Uh, he is a colleague of mine uh, in the spatial planning uh, department, um, uh, and we're good at infrastructure as well. Um, and I work, uh, you can see in the middle, for um, two of me the members of Gedeputeerde Staten. Um, in every city on the right side, you have um, a mayor and aldermen, wethouders. Uh, in the provinces uh, in the Netherlands, we call them Gedeputeerden. So uh, I work for a gedeputeerde, and um, one of the uh, and the um, uh, it, it, that's more or less the same as a uh, elderman in a city or a wet, uh, an wethouder. Um, and um, you can see the minister president is more or less the same as the commissioner of the king, uh, and the mayor uh, in the um, three uh, organizations in the Netherlands. Just to give you a short introduction. What is the province and um, how does it work? And that's the, one of the most important questions I get for five years now already, uh, since I've been uh, involved in the uh, cross-border mobility um, uh, discussions uh, for that Holland. Why is it so important to us? Because it's of very big economic importance, uh, as I have already uh, stated a little bit, um, but it's about customs, it's about tax regulations, um, are you familiar with the CCNR? Uh, I think most of you are not, but the CCNR is the Commission of the Rhine, uh, who was installed hundreds of years ago uh, because they uh, wanted to have free transport along the Rhine, uh, not having every city uh, giving tax regulation to ships uh, uh, sailing from Basel to uh, Duisburg and Rotterdam and Antwerp. So they made their own regulations for a tax-free river. Um, so the CCNR is a cross-border um, uh, mobility platform uh, for starting uh, for hundreds of years already. And that's what you see happening uh, today um, for years. Uh, 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 from my perspective, it is very important to work cross-border to regulate transport uh, or passenger flows uh, along the border. Because if we don't integrate our systems, 
or harmonize uh, uh, the, the way in which we work, you will see and, uh, that tickets or fuel stations, uh, rail tracks uh, or energy grids, they will, um, uh, they will not work over the border. Um, and that would be very, uh, that would be a very big problem. Um, and you can think, well, we're living in the Western part of Europe. We are very uh, well uh, educated. We are, have a very big economic uh, system and the port of Rotterdam and Duisburg, uh, they will know what to do in this matter. But still, we have a lot of paperwork to do. Uh, we, have, we still have a lot of steps to make uh, to integrate our systems. Um, and the inland waterway um, and maritime transport sector um, uh, for, is for us a very important modality. Uh, I will have some figures on that uh, later on in the um, presentation. But besides the economic importance, you see COVID as incident, more or less. Um, uh, we have proven pro, uh, uh, between the Netherlands and Germany, uh, from the, 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 as I have seen happening twice a week, the Netherlands and Germany had a meeting uh, over the whole of 2020 to keep the cross-border transport, people, goods, um, uh, uh, um, uh, buses uh, or um, and ambulances, uh, they were not allowed to just cross the border while uh, there were corona restrictions. Borders were closed. Um, and we, uh, from the, between the Netherlands and Germany, uh, North Rhine-Westphalia to be specific, um, we were able to um, use our cross-border mobility network as a place where we could discuss how to keep the borders open. Um, so the port of Rotterdam was able to transport their goods to Duisburg and further on uh, into Europe. It seems, uh, that, that, well, as I explained it to you right now, that's not even a detail, that's, re that's really important. So from the perspective of South Holland, we try to support these networks and we want to um, um, if this, we want to support this economic importance. And I already explained to you a little bit how to, about the EU corridors. Um, from a transport perspective, these two um, sectors or um, uh, areas inside Holland are very important to our transport um, uh, sectors in, inside Holland. We have the uh, Greenport West Holland. Uh, which is the, the, the greenhouse uh, area, as you can see uh, uh, on the left, Westland, uh, and uh, close to, uh, and on the other side as well. Um, he will make flowers and, and uh, plants and, ver uh, and verbs. Um, um, and it's not, not just the production area, it's also a very um, um, scientific area. The very new uh, things are being developed, so it's, um, uh, it's economically important. And it's from a transport point of view very important. And I don't think I have to say anything about the um, importance of transport flows in the port of Rotterdam. I already explained. Here is the map without the um, United Kingdom um, about the uh, corridor lines on the uh, on the map. And why is the Netherlands so important for inland waterway transport? Well, I've, I've put two figures uh, into this map uh, that shows to you why it is that important. Um, the biggest rivers all go to, um, well, if you go to the seaside, Rotterdam is the biggest port in Europe. Um, the, um, most of the waterways come to Rotterdam and Antwerp on the um, uh, uh, North Sea side of the, um, uh, of the yeah, Northwestern part of Europe. So one third of all vessels in Europe for inland waterway transport are listed in the Netherlands. Uh, and the biggest part of that is listed in South Holland as well. So for us, collaborating in um, uh, cross-border aspects, um, the inland waterway sector and um, supporting them in sustainableizing their, um, uh, their transport is for us very important. Let's see. Um, now I'm not sure. Uh, Cecilia, can you start the um, the, the the movie under uh, the first button? I will try. Can you see it? No. I cannot see it. That's going to be difficult. 
One second. <laughs> Madness. Okay, it's so uh, now. Yes, I can. Do, I can see. And no sound well, or sound. This quarter week is that we have the ambition to bring together networks right. of our existing partners as South Holland to make this corridor, this Euro Delta, stronger, cleaner, and better for our inhabitants. My motto is towards a joint strategy for sustainable and multi-model corridors in one Euro Delta. By teaming up, we will contribute to a prosperous future for the Euro Delta. A prosperous future for three important urban regions in Europe. And last but not least, quality of life for 40 million residents. Let's continue to invest in more European citizens, not only in containers and goods, how important that may be. Citizens make Europe, not containers. <laughs> Some flowers really regard this Euro Delta as being one integrated system for which it's very important to have optimized links and corridors. If the Euro Delta wants to be a true competitive key to Europe to deliver to the corridor approach, which allows to agree on common goals, look at value added and to put the money where it's the most needed. From the representative from the European Parliament to the Port of Rotterdam, other ports, but also the North Hemisphere, Flanders, and the Netherlands. And we can work together in this corridor to get initiatives going. Now is the time to act. Thank you very much, Cecilia. And you please go back to the last uh, slide. I want to explain a little bit more. Yes. I hope I can go back. Yeah. No. No. No, that's the problem. I can only go forward. One moment. Let me see if I can. One second. I but the, the, and while you are trying to reach for this, the, the reason why I show, uh, why I wanted to show you the. Um, uh, the after movie of the quarter week in 2018, which is already almost four years ago, is because it's still very um, accurate for the questions we have, uh, the questions we're facing um, in working uh, uh, together cross border. Um, it's about culture, uh, working together with people from the Netherlands uh, is one way, but working together with people from Belgium, Germany, and even France um, is. Uh, uh, it's sometimes difficult because of culture or differences in uh, working methods. Um, but when we can, we are able to meet each other, discuss with each other, um, we can really set the agenda for um, uh, a next phase in um, what we could achieve. And my uh, commissioner of the King, Jaap Smit, already said in 2018, uh, we would like to go towards a joint strategy for the Euro Delta. Um, and I hope this week, um, is able to put another stone in the wall of reaching for this, uh, for, for a whole agenda, or maybe more realistic, parts of an agenda uh, for the Euro Delta, because I think that's very useful. Um, and uh, as you can see in all the other um, results, uh, I will not um, uh, speak about too long, but um, you see that topics or researches uh, are being done. And that's very important and it's very good that we have them. Um, uh, it's on the, the international uh, rail, it's about um, a sustainable transport, uh, using hydrogen in inland waterway transport. Um, but we have to meet, we have to discuss, we have to find out what's our, if we have any common goals and then make it a political um, um, momentum. Because one of the most important lessons I have learned um, uh, uh, South Holland has put their um, uh, signature under a working agenda in 2019. And if you are able to reach, to reach that, uh, a political agreement on goals you have set together, then you have uh, a lot of momentum to really uh, uh, push forward and uh, make concrete projects um, uh, and work uh, cross-border in a very um, 
well, uh, you have a lot of things you can reach um, in, a, in a mutual way. So um, make it, if you are able to make it political, then you can reach these kind of uh, practical workouts. What you see here is part of the agenda of a, um, a regular meeting I have uh, twice a year with five Dutch provinces and the, the German state of North Westphalia. You can see it is uh, bilingual. Um, and here we discuss all the themes and topics we have in the mobility platform, um, Netherlands, North Rhine-Westphalia. Um, so um, you can imagine this agenda is uh, five or six pages uh, because we have a lot of things to discuss. Um, but that's how it works. You make it a practical point on the agenda. You have uh, people uh, working on it. Uh, um, there is a, um, um, a politician in place who is responsible for it. And then you have some, uh, then you can uh, work out the project in real life, um, realizing um, shared ticketing in uh, the province of Limburg and North Rhine-Westphalia, making uh, hydrogen possible for inland waterway transport between Rotterdam and Duisburg. Two examples of projects we have in this cross-border collaboration. What do we lack? Um, as I already said, we have genetic research is uh, some of the best projects like the styes research and the, the, we have a lot we have networks um, and um, we have the bilateral um, and trilateral political meetings um, if you want to be uh, uh, in a negative uh, mood there's too many uh, uh, covering every part of it but there's no uh, overview who has the overview is there an incentive for a joint strategy? Do we need this overview? Well, that's one question I would like to address um, to you. Uh, um, uh, you are uh, new to the Eurodelta, but you look to it from a um, uh, planners and uh, a spatial and uh, perspective. What could be the incentive for a joint strategy and, on Eurodelta level? And do you agree my point that there is no incentive yet on this moment? Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Klaas. Thank you very much. Okay. So, you can see we have a, a bit of an active chat right there. Um, well, thank you, Klaas. Thank you for this uh, very interesting I mean, for me, very familiar cross-border uh, approach that I've been following myself for in the past years. But I was also interested in what you said about what do we lack? And, and I just have one follow-up question. I mean, if, if you say, what do we lack? And you're now presenting at the Next Generation podium. Do you think we also lack in this scale and in this working sphere on cross-border mobility and infrastructure, and especially with integrating the next generation, do you think we're lacking also this approach in, a, in academia? And it should be a next step to involve this next generation also on a, let's call it corridor curriculum point of view. Do you think this could be interesting for the cross-border collaboration that you as a province of South Holland are already very active with? And as far as I know, with students as well. So I was wondering what your opinion is on that. I think that's very interesting indeed, um, because it's as you uh, organize this network of students uh, and institutions uh, for the second time uh, already on the Eurodelta level, um, um, from a transport point of view, the corridor level, as you can see uh, in the back, the um, sometimes the same questions arise, but sometimes they're very thematically um, uh, driven. So. If we can, um, how do I say this? Um, if we can reach a point of discussion between Eurodelta as an area and the corridor as one of the lines, that's the, the, sometimes we have the same discussion and sometimes it's just thematical, but a corridor curriculum with international points of view from the Netherlands, from Switzerland, from Italy, and combining every point of view and every question we have from all parts of the corridor as we you do now in this um, uh, next generation Eurodelta, I think it's very 
interesting. And I know the, um, uh, the, the harmonizing all the, um, all the goals the European Commission have for the sustainable transport. Um, just one uh, small um, uh, example. The European Commission tells me they want um, zero emission vessels to be market ready in 2030. Well, that's one of the things we are working on for three years already. Um, but we're still waiting to uh, get to this first, re to really get to this first um, um, scale up uh, kind of ships for the, uh, the, the, on the Rhine River. So we're in discussing, but how we are on the uh, South Holland side, how is Italy doing this? What is Switzerland doing on this? Do we have to um, bring them together by ourselves or can we um, use networks like these um, uh, and students instead of locked, uh, locked in um, uh, civil servants um, to think of new solutions to sustainable transport. So I think it's interesting to combine thoughts, energy and um, um, this, uh, the different institutions. Exactly. And I think different scales also of intervention. And that's why we're having this forum. I see a couple of interesting questions in the chat. Um, thank you, Eric, for uh, this integrated mega regional strategy, which is something I think in the course of the entire next generation podium will touch upon this. And we're also working on this in the various thematic topics that you've mentioned there. And I think this is something we cannot answer right now, but we will look into over the course of the week. But uh, there is a student from LBTH University who also picked up the Eurodelta discussion and would like to know what are the open sources of data regarding cross-border mobility to look up for in the Netherlands, Belgium, France, to better understand the existing issues and get this overview, as you mentioned. Short answer, please. This is one of the interesting parts because we don't have these, as far as I know, but I should um, uh, call my colleagues at Rijkswaterstaat, but um, we try to combine different data from uh, uh, data uh, places from Germany, Netherlands, and Belgium to make this one uh, open source uh, uh, data background, but it's not there yet. I this think is it difficult. Is, but I think Espen Stey's research is the first approach, as far as I'm concerned. Indeed. But we'll so hear more about that maybe later. But this is something the students will also be provided with. So. Just to you directly see it, uh, I think this is something you can also find links to on our Eurodelta discussion. We're pushing forward that the Espen Styles research is exactly this database that can give you a first overview on this cross-border mobility and infrastructure and sustainable transport topic. And there you will find more first approaches because it's been a research for over a year and the results are freshly new published. So this is, I think, a first good start. We will. Um, continue now with our next presentation because I do, do not want to run out of time. So um, I would like to ask Oliver La, uh, I introduced you for before shortly, but I think we would be very interested to hear your um, input on, uh, on uh, your uh, interventions or the uh, urban living labs that you have created, I think with Theo Berlin and uh, the Wuppertal Institute is very active also in the field of international mobility and cross-border cooperation. And we would like to hear from you from a research institute point of view on what projects you have that touch upon this topic that we're currently discussing, but now we're going to a different scale. So the floor is yours. Uh, if you have a presentation, I hope you can upload it. I do not I have do. it back. Okay. Thank you so much for having me, Cecilia. Much appreciated and nice, uh, great to see you, nice to join you. I hope you can hear me okay. And I am, oh, wait a minute, I'm sure I'm the wrong. Are you joining from Berlin or from Wuppertal? From good old Berlin, where it is nice and sunny today, actually. Uh, yeah, this is where I'm based. So uh, let me maybe just, okay, oops. Can you see my slides now? Mm. Or no, not yet. I suppose it's also dark for me, but maybe now. Same problem. No, one more time. Can you press the full screen button in your presentation? Okay. Uh, Sorry from that. We did see your desktop, though. Ah. 
that mean? No. Yes, perfect. Okay, cool. Great. Um, uh, great to see you. And uh, so maybe just uh, from brief background, uh, where we are based and um, then a deeper dive on what we are working on and how this, uh, any of this could be relevant or interesting for you. Um, so uh, we are a UN Habitat Collaborating Center and we are co-hosted between the uh, MIT, the TU Berlin and the Wuppertal Institute. And we work with uh, partner cities and partner universities in Europe, Asia, Africa, and Latin America uh, on transformative living labs. So uh, that's another uh, way of um, saying we're doing quite a deep dive on uh, innovative solutions uh, in urban space, urban energy, urban mobility, and the integration of, uh, of sectors test uh, different innovations to show their uh, validity, uh, their potential contributions to emission reductions, to accessibility, to improving livelihoods, um, uh, also generating economic opportunities um, in our partner cities. And um, all of that is happening in a, a participatory way so that's that's how we uh, look at uh, urban living labs so that this is a co-development process between actors from academia from local authorities public authorities um, at the local and national level uh, private sector actors industry startups um, from the regions internationally um, uh, civil society organizations and we all work together on a, a concerted approach because you know one drive of this is uh, decarbonizing uh, our cities and uh, um, this can only happen if we all work together in a multi-actor coalition towards a more concerted approach so while in some of the cases uh, or most of the cases uh, in the urban living labs we focus on specific interventions we contextualize them in a much more transformative um, package to make sure that all the dots are connected, that we don't just uh, do some uh, fragmented approach, some individual improvements of efficiency, but that we can make this contribution to the more transformative change. I don't want to dive in too deep on, on to this little picture, but just to uh, illustrate a bit that we are looking at a sometimes small intervention, but it is part of a, of a bigger picture. We do that in cities such as Montevideo and Quito in Latin America, Kigali and Dar es Salaam in Africa, um, uh, Madrid, Hamburg uh, in Europe, uh, Hanoi, Hanoi, Manila in, in Asia. So quite active in a number of projects such as Urban Pathways, Solutions Plus, Access, Trend Safe, CSI and others. Um, and uh, as part of that, we, we are establishing regional hubs. So that's always based in a partner university that is part of, uh, of an ongoing consortium so that they do have an active role and a basis to start from. And they are uh, involved in at least one of the living labs that usually then links uh, uh, master's programs um, with activities that we are uh, undertaking in the partner city so that for example a master's student would then do uh, their assignment uh, or their thesis on one of the activities within the living lab so that the academic angle of it is very closely embedded onto uh, uh, the on the ground work with uh, the partners in uh, in the urban living labs. And we'll cut this across uh, some thematic areas across then the individual hubs and cities um, across different topical areas. So this is where uh, some of the students, masters and PhDs in particular then are coming from, from urban planning, urban mobility, energy resources, so that we also cut, uh, cut across the regions, but also across the sectoral elements that, that are uh, you know essentially linked together in those transformative processes and we do focus uh, our work on, uh, on urban change makers so those who are sitting either local or national authorities who are working in the private sectors in a startup or in a more established industry 
in uh, public uh, transport operators, for example, and of course research institutions, financing institutions as well. And we go through a reasonably structured process where we start with informing uh, our then still potential partners on the various solutions that are out there. We are sharing that in a short and crisp um, overview way where we, for example, in the area of sustainable mobility, share um, experiences on innovative e-mobility solutions on public transport, on walking and cycling infrastructure, so that basically they can, the partners can pick and choose from what is most appropriate in my context, what is relevant for me and my city. And then we take them from this initial thought of, okay, here we have uh, other cities who have basically done the same thing to start inspiring them a bit more with the experiences that peers had in the good and bad way. We don't just always share good practices. It's also sometimes, you know, bad practices or as we would call them experiences in general. And um, that is a, a core element of our capacity building uh, program that um, students can participate in, that uh, planners and practitioners uh, are participating in, in different formats. And I'll share a few uh, ongoing opportunities with you in the chat in a second. Um, uh, that is also then guided by some peer-to-peer -peer exchange. So we do the more classical um, uh, capacity building, but then also on specific topics. Um, there's peer-to-peer -peer exchange between the different actors in the field um, and uh, picking them on, up on their different levels of experiences across the process. And um, that brings us to a critical point that is um, relevant for our living labs initiating partnerships that actually want to work on the implementation of uh, those certain uh, innovations. So for example, one of those vehicles that you see here is a Safa Tempo, um, an electric vehicle in the city of Kathmandu in Nepal that we revamp and co-develop in the new format, um, bringing this together with uh, setups for uh, uh, multimodal hubs in the city. This is being done with a local startup in the city, with the public transport operator, with the local authority, with a local university, with a local uh, NGO working on walking and cycling. Um, and so here, then we have uh, what is, you know, cryptically called the, you know, the quadruple helix. So basically the team that is important to make this happen in a way where this is co-owned by all key actors. And then we start implementing this. So this can start with a co-design of vehicle. So here, of course, it is important to pick both the perspective of the vehicle developer, but also those who are using it as an operator, but also who are using it as, uh, as a user at the end. And of course, those who are involved in actually having this on their road in the local authority. So this is quite critical that we don't just see it from the way of, you know, this is a product that you can sell. Um, this is a product that actually adds, adds value to objectives of all the key players. And uh, this is then being integrated and uh, this, those demonstrations can run depending on the projects anywhere between six months and four years. Um, uh, uh, but normally it's anywhere between six months and 18 months to have then still time to take those learnings from the demonstration and bring them into a more scalable projects. This is where we are currently, for example, with a project called Solutions Plus, which is supported by the European Union, which is um, uh, born out of a previous project called Urban Pathways, where we prepared a, a large number of urban living maps. And here we are taking several of them further into the e-mobility sphere. So here we are covering basically the whole range of shared and um, uh, public mobility solutions to then uh, provide a basis for broader impact. So yes, many of those demonstrations might just uh, include uh, 10 or maybe 50 electric uh, motorbikes or tuk-tuks or maybe just one or two electric buses. But this is just a stepping stone for a broader approach. And um, for that, of course, we need to do our co-evaluation, which means we identify together with the partners in the team 
uh, key performance indicators that are relevant for them and for us in 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 um, in the more broader context, um, and uh, then use that data uh, and that evidence that we gather um, to make a case for a scaled up, more transformative project that can then go to a national funding authority that can then go to a, a, a development bank, for example. And all of this is also meant to provide a basis for coalition building, for consensus on addressing and linking some of the key objectives that are via, uh, that are relevant for, um, for all the key partners. The key thing here is that um, we have um, not just uh, the basis for for this one living lab and not just testing one innovation, but this contributes to a wider transition within the city. So this is quite important for us. So this is where, of course, uh, integrating the key actors and stakeholders is very important. And um, I realized that I only have two more minutes. How 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 much do I need to rush? I'll rush. It's okay. Just go ahead. It's okay. Okay, cool. Uh, then I'll take a breather. Uh, so just uh, um, uh, sh sharing one of the examples, just to show how this, this normally looks like in a very, uh, you know, simple but uh, straightforward uh, case, uh, which we have done in our building on in our partner city Belo Horizonte in Brazil. Um, there we uh, did something very simple. Uh, uh, the the integration of a low speed zone in. So, how do I get this? Sorry. Normally, a the, when a classical phone rings, this never happens <laughs> these days. Um, uh, sorry, uh, where were we? <laughs> um, so, in Belo Horizonte, we work with our partner city on, on introducing a low speed zone within the city. Um, that is uh, in an area that is, uh, you could say, more of a low income. Uh, uh, household area um, uh, and around a, a public school uh, uh, in that area. So that was also deliberately chosen to um, uh, integrate uh, partners uh, in that area and also to address one point that was uh, very relevant, uh, improving the road safety in that area. But of course, then uh, one uh, another element of that, of course, to to uh, address other key objectives, but one of the key drivers was, was the, the safety element. And this all starts with a local champion. So that local champion can be you, of course, right? When you work in a local authority. And then we built this whole team around uh, the academics, the private sector actors, the civil society actors um, uh, to uh, then start the initial idea. And already in a case like this, for example, it is great to then involve, uh, in this case, the school students too, in the participatory design, which has a lot of ownership for them, but it also trickles back to their families um, who then feel that this is something that is being done for and with uh, the local community um, that is not uh, rammed in from an outside actor. Um, and then, of course, you, you develop all the key elements of it. And uh, I also use this pic, uh, this uh, case because uh, it's an intervention that is very low cost, very mm. easily uh, implemented, but it has a very impactful um, uh, visual uh, element for the local community. And it also shows the one key element that we would like to sh uh, see in, in, in our partner city is there's changes of prioritization that, you know, we're trying, pushing the cars out and getting the people in so that there is more uh, livelihood, more uh, safety, more livability for people and not uh, just a parking space or a road for cars. So this can happen uh, across just a couple of weeks. Um, key element here is then of course that um, uh, within that initial phase, you start gathering some evidence, you get some visibility, the mayor was there, the, the press was there. Um, so lots of a very positive drive for such an intervention. You go then out uh, um, with your local change makers and talk about the success of it to make sure that this can be sustained. Um, 
uh, and even scaled up. And this is also what happened in that case. We started with one. Now this is being rolled out in 30 neighborhoods in this city. And this is being also taken further to other cities in the region who would like to basically do the same thing. Um, so that learner, Belo Horizonte, who would, took up the initial idea of a cycling street of this, uh, from the city of Bremen, now becomes a leader. And uh, uh, this is just one illustrative example of, of uh, our urban living labs. You are very welcome to also uh, put in a little video from our city of uh, Belo Horizonte, which the uh, Virtuality Fund did, just to get a little um, um, uh, impression there. But you can do that later, not, not during the next lecture, please. And also there is um, a little e-course that we're currently doing uh, that will start later this May um, uh, with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, an uh, online course where we will um, do a deeper dive on the living lab development and where you can join us for some exchange on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you very much. Thank you for this brief introduction to something very, I mean, complex because you've got all the scales in one. I think you also have this network-based approach and I like this informal process of how you highlighted where you go, where you come from informing to inspiring to initiating, then implementing and also evaluating the impact. And as we've just seen in this example, in Belo Horizonte, this can also you know, be scaled up and there's a replicability uh, aspect that we are also, I think, looking for in the Euro Delta. And this is a very interesting approach. Thank you for that. I'm not sure if there's a, con yes, there is a concrete question to you in the chat right now from Malvika. Um, very, very much based on urban mobility and the electricity aspect and topic of where does the electricity come from in the future with all the events happening currently. And of course, if we uh, use this electricity generated from coal or gas or power plants, not to mention lithium batteries, you know, the mining for the batteries and where these very uh, specific elements are coming from. Are we really solving the problem of urban mobility then with shifting to these new electricity sources or are we merely shifting it elsewhere? What is your opinion on that? Well, yeah, I mean, it's a simple question, but you know, it's important to, to, to answer, right? Um, of course, the presentation here was more focusing on the living lab than you know, what we could do, do another session on mobility. So, but just in, 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 in short, um, uh, in our primary partner countries in Solutions Plus, for example, we focus on countries that have a high share of renewables in the fleet already. And of course, as I mentioned, we focus uh, only on uh, shared and public transport solutions um, with regard to e-mobility. So resource efficiency is uh, uh, an, an essential element in that, as well as energy efficiency. A two and a half ton um, uh, electric uh, Tesla does not contribute uh, uh, you know, driving in China or in Poland does not contribute anything to sustainable development. It's a, uh, it's a shiny toy that does not have a sustainability value. What we are focusing on is electric. Um, uh, two and three wheelers, uh, four shared fleets for public transportation, for last mile connectivity, electric buses for public transport. And of course, there will be a remaining level of um, individual transport that will still be a version of a car. Um, uh, important is to have as few as possible uh, of those. We are not aiming for a two billion car uh, fleet uh, in the future. Uh, that is also not sensible with regard to urban space that we have. Um, uh, so as few as possible individually owned cars um, and uh, of those as resource efficient, as small, as still safe um, as possible. That's of course clear, but yeah, just good that. <laughs> that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the answer. I hope it was more or less answered, but we can also pick this up in the later discussion. There's one concrete question to you, Oliver. How can you give the participants some directions on how to upscale such a living lab initiative? Very interesting question. So, I mean, one thing that that um, comes across in all of those cases is that, in general, there is more than enough money floating around, 
right? They have, the development banks are uh, desperately looking for projects to fund. Um, uh, the, the, the move towards more sustainable and more efficient um, mobility systems in that example, but also, you know, um, uh, electricity systems as we uh, more and more see is saving money, not costing more money. But of course, the transition um, uh, is an important element that needs to be bridged. And the Living Lab can just help de-risking also those investments, right? So that you have the, uh, an improved level of certainty that those investments will pay off um, that those business models can sustain themselves. So this is where where, where this helps much more than just um, a dry feasibility study. Um, it gives it much more meat to the bone, much more validity of, of a case for investors, for business developers, or for public uh, investment. Um, uh, so yeah, it can be a helpful stepping stone. Yes, thank you very much for this answer. So I think it's time to move on because uh, yeah, we're a bit running out of time, but I think we will manage. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Michiel de Pap, who is an urban designer and researcher to come up front and uh, explain to us from a more local scale and especially also a desi design focus and also project-based approach once again, but uh, let's call it research by design. And he will do a presentation on comprehensive mobilities, which is a fairly new term to me too. And the topic is transit-oriented development as a lever for coherent territories and peripheral contexts. Let's hear more about that. Uh, you work very much in the Belgian and German context. So I hope you will highlight this a bit more to us so we understand also your cross-border approach. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, first of all, I will also try to share my screen and hope it goes uh, smoothly like that. Did that work? Yes, perfect. Okay, that's perfect. So indeed, it's a long title, but I will I will jump over it. What I want to tell you about today is actually the link between urban planning, uh, spatial planning, and mobility, which is uh, for us as urban planners a very important aspect sustainable development in general and yeah we're based in Flanders and Flanders has a very specific uh, spatial structure and specific challenges and that's what we try to uh, solve. The project I'm going to show you is called Regenet Leuven uh, and it's exactly dealing with uh, with these specific challenges. So it's not so much cross-border in the way that we are not crossing the border to another country but we didn't Flanders, it's already quite uh, a regional uh, and, and a bit uh, super local uh, uh, approach. But I think it, it touches a lot of subjects that are also interesting uh, for other countries that are maybe not as badly uh, spatially organized as Belgium, but uh, uh, might see the same uh, challenges. Before showing the project, I'm shortly going to uh, uh, say a little bit uh, about uh, uh, the office that I'm working for, which is uh, BUR. We are a division of Sweco. Uh, Sweco is an international um, yeah, engineering uh, uh, company. We are one division of, uh, of this bigger uh, uh, company. Um, around, I'm not sure actually right now, I think we are about 170 collaborators within our division. Um, and we do spatial planning in a very broad way. So we, we focus on master planning, design of public space, landscape architecture, but also environmental planning, research. It's, it's a lot of things uh, that come together. And in that, we work also together with the other divisions of SWECO, which are more focusing on infrastructure, on energy, uh, on, on industry. Um, and we like to use this, uh, this proverb, it takes a village uh, to raise a child. That's also how we see a bit our approach. We like to work very multidisciplinary um, and we're very happy that we can do this now within our own company, let's say with all the different expertises that we, uh, that we gather together. Um, and as I said, well, just some examples, we make master plans, very big ones, sometimes also smaller ones, of course. Um, we design and realize public space and infrastructure, um, and we do a lot of regional planning as well. And it's more this regional uh, uh, scale that I'm going to focus on today, but it has some uh, links also to more uh, uh, local interventions, uh, as also the regional plans have to be implemented locally, of course. But before starting with the project, a short, uh, let's say, excursion to Flanders, because um, I'm not so sure if everyone is aware uh, about what is then this uh, challenging spatial condition that in Flanders we are dealing with. Um, 
this is a map it shows the euro delta in a bit of france uh, a bit less of germany but good uh, you can imagine what's going on on the right um and it's yeah you don't have to be a, an expert to see that there is something strange happening here in flanders if you come yeah, if you uh, compare the settlement patterns that you see in the Netherlands and in the north of France with very compact uh, villages and around the open space, in Flanders there is a cloud, uh, which is what we call the a nebular city, the Nevelstad. Um, it's the consequence of, uh, yeah, uh, um, right now already 70 years of uh, bad planning, let's say, that led to this, uh, this spatial uh, structure that we have right now. It's not a new thing in the 60s already. People were uh, writing about it and calling it the ugliest uh, country in the world. We can discuss about that. But at least from an urban planning perspective, it's definitely a, a challenge. Um, just as an example, uh, I used to live in Stuttgart and therefore I made this map to show people like this is how, let's say, good urban planning would look like. You have uh, in the region of Stuttgart, you have some settlements, villages, um, they are compact, they have inside of each of the villages, you have some industry, uh, you have some uh, dispersed housing and you have some apartments there is centrally there is an s-bahn station for public transport so everything is well connected and in between you have open space with agriculture with forests with nature that's how a, a, a proper a planned a, a country would look like uh, in belgium you see this type of things uh, this is not so far from leuven so you see you also have villages and they have an historical background they even have some heritage there they are sometimes even nice to visit but in between the villages they built everywhere that's we call it a uh, uh, I cannot translate. It's a linear structure building, limbo bowing, as we say, along the streets. And in between, you have open space, but this open space is very fragmented. And you can imagine it's not only bad for open space, for ecological uh, values and um, just for how the, uh, the area looks like. It's also very complicated to organize an, effect, an efficient mobility system within uh, such a, a, a mess, let's say. Uh, if you live here, you only have one solution, which is the car, because you're far away from the center, you're far away from shops. And of course, the bus can try to visit these houses, but yeah, it will take a lot of time, which is actually also happening. And you will never have a bus stop so close to your house if you live somewhere uh, just regularly like that. So that's uh, this is how it looks if you look at it from the sky. Um, and without really going into detail, the reason that we ended up here is not only because people, yeah, they built wherever they want. We also have uh, a zoning plan that looks like this. And if that's, let's say, the, the zoning plan that tries to bring structure, then you can imagine uh, that it's not helping a lot if the zoning plan itself is already looking uh, very chaotic uh, like this one here. Uh, the consequences. If you have some knowledge of urban planning, you can imagine yourself what are the problems. We have the most traffic congestion of Europe in Flanders uh, because everyone needs to take the car. Um, there is a lot of problems also for flooding and you have houses everywhere. So a lot of uh, houses are built in potential flood zones. We saw it last summer, uh, what that uh, uh, leads to. Um, there is a lot of air pollution. Well, that's also in the south of Netherlands, so that's not only, not only in Belgium, but there is definitely a black spot on the map um, if you look at uh, uh, the air pollution coming from mobility. And the fragmentation of the open space is not good, also not good for agriculture, for nature. And even think about yeah, having some energy production, putting windmills somewhere in this, in this uh, 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 area is also not so easy. So it, it, it brings a lot of special challenges with it. And there is a lot of quality and identity, a loss of quality and identity in the villages. A lot of these villages, yeah, they look like this. They don't have an identity anymore. They're car oriented and they are ugly. And yeah, people don't feel, uh, uh, yeah, they, they feel lost in their own village uh, if it's starting to look like that. And it's all very expensive uh, because, yeah, the more dispersed you live, the more it costs to get to get you uh, all the uh, 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 utilities that you need, and so on and so forth. So. That's the condition that we are working all the time. Um, we try to solve that step by step. But with Regenet Leuven, we try to take a big step. Eh? That's the idea of Regenet Leuven. Um, is a regional project that gives a new spatial um, and mobility vision for the whole region of Leuven. It's, it started as a research project that we did together with the University of Leuven. But it grew in the last 10 years. It grew into um, yeah, a large collaboration on regional scale with a lot of actors involved and we're extremely happy about that. Uh, it includes the province, it includes the mobility uh, um, agencies, uh, it includes the different municipalities and cities, uh, all thinking together about how to uh, deal with this uh, situation. Uh, we are living uh, here, that's the region of Leuven that we are talking about. 
which the region, it has the same problems as, as we have in area, uh, older areas of uh, Flanders. So, for example, 30% of houses lie outside the villages and cities. So, in this, yeah, not easy uh, to reach uh, areas. It looks like that again, also here. Um, and you see that, yeah, there is this double thing eh? the mobility, the fact, the fact that people can have a car and Wherever you live, you can get there with your car. So that's a driver of suburbanization. But of course, this suburbanization is a driver of car dependency, and you have a cycle that goes on and on. Uh, and yeah, in the end, uh, uh, destroys both your mobility system and your spatial planning. Um, if you have then a, a public transport network, you can imagine how, yeah, this is how the bus network looks like right now. You can see it's not it's not very efficient uh, to have these buses going everywhere. So the idea of Regonet is to put an end to that. And uh, they put uh, we put uh, clear ambitions from the beginning, which would be to decrease the car use with 20% and to double uh, the bike and uh, public transport use. Uh, that's, let's say, uh, it's not it's not extremely ambitious if you look at the number, but it is already a big change. It would bring the uh, car dependency already uh, uh, more in a balanced uh, uh, situation. The idea by that is a new spatial organization uh, where we try to have more compact villages, um, get rid of this, uh, this suburbanized, suburbanized uh, uh, housing uh, habits, um, concentrate new uh, uh, residential developments around uh, a course, and then uh, develop in every core uh, 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 a good mobility hub that makes the whole core uh, uh, um, uh, multimodally uh, accessible. That's one of the aspects, of course, not so easy to realize. Uh, another idea is yeah, instead of having all these uh, slow and low frequent bus lines to create a, a more uh, a high frequent and more um, efficient uh, uh, public transport uh, network where there would be one core line and uh, that is a fast line that connects the big uh, uh, settlements and then you will have more uh, local uh, feeder lines uh, that will people that bring people from uh, more uh, remote villages to this uh, to the central line. And by doing that, we can also create a, a corridor uh, development. So creating high dynamic transport corridors along this, uh, this uh, more uh, efficient uh, public transport. Um, and like that, yeah, uh, supporting sort of a, a corridor uh, development. So this is the idea to definitely uh, uh, improve and strengthen this um, public transport along the corridors with the railway uh, where it's possible otherwise with uh, with more local systems we uh, believe a lot in what we call the tram bus which is a bus line that is yeah super efficient has its own line and goes fast but does not need for investments in uh, uh, in railway uh, infrastructure um, so that's one element. Another element is that we invest a lot in bike infrastructure. Um, also there, we, uh, we believe a lot in uh, high-speed um, bike lanes uh, in between the bigger uh, settlements, supported by a very, uh, um, yeah, a very uh, detailed uh, uh, local uh, bike network. And of course, that also demands quite some infrastructure uh, investments to make these lines as uh, uh, good as possible. The combination of that leads to this uh, synthesis map. Uh, that's the spatial vision for Leuven. Leuven is the central of this region. You have some other cities around it. You have these uh, public transport corridors. And the idea is then, of course, that along these tran transport corridors, we will also uh, focus all the new developments so that, this, let's say, the villages, the cores that are along these corridors, they can have a lot of uh, growth. They can uh, have new, new residential developments, whereas the, um, the villages and, uh, uh, and towns that are in between it they get a future that is more uh, local, that is uh, uh, less dynamic, um, and is more oriented towards strengthening and protection of what is there, and not so much growth and, uh, uh, and uh, attraction of uh, dynamic uh, functions and activities. So, for example, for the, uh, the corridor between Leuven and Dist, yeah, the first part is that yeah, we have to uh, develop this faster public transport. This is something that we're really actively researching now. It's not so easy because this area, uh, this, this lane that you have there, it's not so wide. So, at many spaces, you don't have space for, have, for having a double lane uh, uh, dedicated public transport uh, corridor. So, there we have to work with a single lane that at certain areas, yeah, it splits and then the, the, let's say the bus can meet another bus and then they can, can go back on their one lane. That's the only way that we can uh, fit it uh, within the street at many spaces, but where it's spaced enough, you can, of course, have a double lane like that. So this is the one aspect is having uh, this much better uh, uh, connectivity um, that brings people to the higher, uh, the more, uh, uh, for example, to the city of Leuven. 
And of course, we can then uh, support this further by developing uh, the nodes and the, the stops of this public transport as really new uh, uh, um, centers of, uh, of development. And this is, for example, an example. This is research by design, as was said in the beginning. So um, we are really working on this now. We are trying to make this uh, uh, feasible together with the public transport company, really realizing this, uh, this lane. On the other hand, we are looking at what are the possibilities to then yeah, develop these areas, because by developing an, a village like this, this is how it looks right now, um, by developing it with a lot of new houses, quality, sustainable housing with green and with everything, eh, diverse and whatever you need, um, you also support, of course, uh, the feasibility of this public transport hub there, because you have more people, there is a higher capacity of people using it, and you can develop the, um, the hub itself as more than just a public transport node, it can become really the new center of the village, where you have a multimodal um, offer of also other yeah, uh, car sharing, uh, bike sharing uh, uh, possibilities, and of course, quite some facilities and shops and so on. Uh, and then you can also create a new village uh, uh, image and yeah, uh, work also on this uh, on these aesthetics. What's important, and of course, is is one one thing is to to uh, concentrate new developments in these village centers. Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, we believe that this is really uh, going uh, to strengthen them uh, uh, and make them stronger for the future. But of course, we are not dealing so much with what is already being built of what can still be built in the open space. So that's a very complicated topic that I'm not going to touch too much about. The principle is that if you have villages or areas where you can build that are not well located to a public transport, yeah, we also want to move the building rights to the other area where we then allow people to build higher, to build more, to build more tents. So that's the idea of transferable development rights. Um, this is a discussion. I'm not going to go into that. For many years, we're discussing that. And it's not so clear. It's not so uh, clear yet how to do this legally. But it's definitely something that has been discussed uh, a lot in uh, in Flanders. Another option is yeah, to work with zoning. Uh, we're urban planners as well. Also there, I'm not going to uh, dive too much into it. But you have a lot of regulations. Uh, the existing zoning plan, you have to change it. It's something that is more diverse, that allows more, yeah, that, that strengthens and also supports this, uh, this spatial vision. So that's <laughs> definitely the most complicated part of this whole project. It's not so much the research by design, is, but uh, to get it uh, implemented in, uh, in zonings mm -hmm. and regulations. Um, but that's maybe something for another time to discuss further. Um, we did more than that, and we also really ca categorized every core of this whole area in different, uh, yeah, in different categories. And to each category, we um, give, let's say, a sort of a development potential uh, over the development perspective, where you see that yeah, the, the lighter ones, they get more, and the green ones, they get a bit less. We did this also with the data perspective, so we really calculated this um, with a lot of GIS uh, uh, stuff that we did, but also there I'm not going to jump too far. Um, and the last thing that I want to strengthen is, yeah, it's not only about these corridors. Um, yeah, that's one thing we want to have a very fast connection from Leuven to this, for example, so that everyone that lives here can get to there and then take this, uh, this bus uh, to go to Leuven in a fast way. Um, but it's more than that. We really want to develop these hubs, um, thinking on the spatial context and the network level, and not only in the cities and on these, uh, in these corridors, but also in the smaller villages. And that's where we developed this idea of the Mobipunt, which is now called uh, Hobbin Punt, uh, Hobbin Punt in, uh, uh, in Flanders, which I said a bit before, it's not just the place where the tram or the bus stops, uh, it's a combination of both uh, facilities, uh, uh, transport accommod accommodation, but also just investing in public space and in the quality of public space in, in, in such a village. Uh, it's still having this, uh, this corridor in the center, it will still be uh, what we call a street village, um, but you can create some public space with, with nice uh, green and, and some other elements that, uh, that improve also the aesthetical uh, quality of, this, uh, of these places. And then the last thing I want to say, of course, if we are investing in these corridors, we should also invest in the open space and in the local villages around it, where we don't want growth, but we still want the quality of life, of course. Um, so there, there are other things that are of importance. These are areas that, yeah, then we need to reevaluate it for agriculture, for nature and recreation, for renewable energy in the form of windmills. Uh, and also there, of course, there needs to be investment in uh, in traffic, but it will then be on a very local public transport level, not with a fixed lane, a fixed uh, uh, trajectory, but more uh, demand-based uh, uh, transit and things like that. 
And then also there we can we can give a let's say a future perspective for villages like this, where agriculture and nature and recreation are at the center, and not so much growth and uh, and new facilities uh, uh, as it would be if you look uh, if you are uh, in these corridors themselves. So this is a plan that we developed. Uh, it has been growing for many years. It's supported by uh, also more detailed research on what these corridors could look like, what the transport uh, uh, solutions are. Um, but it's also much more than that. It's really it's a, it's it's um, a process of of governance. You can imagine that this, this this is not even a province. It's smaller than a province, and there is in the beginning there was not really let's say uh, um, an identity for this for this region. Now the province is supporting us, we have all the municipalities involved, but also there you can imagine that the municipality that is here or a city like Leuven are much more in favor of this plan than a municipality that is sort of isolated here and sees itself as, oh, we, we are not supposed to grow anymore, what is then our future? So this is a process that we are doing for many years already now, step by step, working with politicians, with mayors and trying to get um, step by step to the realization of, uh, of this plan. And not so long ago, uh, the whole Regunet uh, project was signed by a lot of mayors, so that was already an important thing uh, from different political parties, different backgrounds. So this definitely was an important uh, milestone. We're also working on the identity of the region. And of course, yeah, as I said, uh, the technical uh, uh, under uh, support of having yeah, this uh, quite uh, uh, yeah, also infrastructure uh, 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 oriented uh, uh, approach. So that was for today. There are two websites that you can uh, consult to find more about it. There is the official website, regenetleuven.be. There you find the current situation. There is our own website, regenetleuven.be. That contains our initial vision that we developed, uh, untouched and unspoiled by any politician, <laughs> and any process going on. So the top one shows what we are uh, trying to get uh, uh, through the political process. The bottom one uh, shows the pure idea from the beginning. And therefore, uh, that's where I uh, would stop today. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, yeah, very interesting um, condition, first of all. I mean, we're, I think, all quite aware of a very dispersed landscape in Belgium and how you would like to approach this and change this in the future. And it sounds to me like there needs to be also a behavioral change. And of course, the movement of cars, it's a very, very car dominated country. And we see this also changing in other countries. I've worked a lot in Switzerland, and I, I know that this transit oriented development is the way to go. In, the, in, in Switzerland also with the backbone of a very good rail infrastructure. And I think um, also this idea of shifting, you know, settlements outside in the, in the periphery towards more the backbone of transport and having these nodes. And again, you mentioned corridors. So also on a regional level, corridors are important, not just on a cross-border international level, but basically you were just showing in your regional plan how you can, you know, break it down to a regional plan and having Again, this blueprint of a corridor as this uh, infrastructure keeping and holding the settlements together and interconnecting them well enough and bringing this behavioral change about. So that's a very interesting project. And I see a lot of similarities to other informal planning procedures in order to get these different actors and stakeholders also on board and developing such a such a strategy further. But of course, it's very, very much long, long term planning. And of course, they're always other actors also dropping out who are not on the map who want to be on the map and this is very interesting how you create this inclusivity there as well but this is i think now open to discussion and i would like to ask everyone maybe also for the final 10 minutes to put up their videos and have a public discussion because this is what it's all about we shouldn't hide ourselves but there are a couple of interesting questions in the chat and i'm going to pick up from wendy van der Horst directly with your experience in um, transit-oriented development as a planning principle, how useful do you find this perspective for long-term planning and how well does it accommodate the integration of all the themes that need our attention, which is also what the next generation is focusing on in various fields. So could you maybe highlight that in the long-term planning? I mean, how, how do you integrate all these topics together? That are mentioned here, climate adaptation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'm, I'm, I'm reading it as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's complicated. Yeah. I mean, I, I tried to summarize the whole project in 15 minutes and to touch a lot of the different dimensions, as it dimensions that it has. I think it, it, it already 
has seen quite a shift, a shift and an evolution. In the beginning, it was very mobi mobility oriented. Um, then we shifted our perspective towards this open landscape and, and what we can also mean for the, the, the small villages. There is the energy uh, element, uh, aspect that I'm not really, that I was not really touching. Many things are, are included in it, but what we mainly learned from this process is uh, as an urban planner, you, you are a multidisciplinary person. Right? You, you are a generalist. You try to, to think of everything. And you can draw this on the map, and you can have a plan. Uh, this plan for a unit is this map that I showed. This is it's going around since years already. But what we now are, I guess we already suspected that. But in the beginning, we were not focusing too much on that. To, to get it realized, that, that is the main, the main big challenge. It's a political and a juridical process, most, most of all. Um, and as you said, also a, behavior, a behavioral uh, 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 evolution that is, uh, that is uh, behind it. We as urban planners, we'd like to look from the top, which is, of course, the perspective that we often have when we make maps. And I think it's important to have this background, to have this long-term plan. That is something that people can look at and can share as a vision for the future. But in the end, it will not yeah, it will never be realized as it is on the plan. It's, that's, let's say, the vision that we share. And we have to be sure that the vision has all the sustainability uh, aspects in it that, uh, that are necessary. But in the end, what is much more important is this, yeah, this, this very slow step-by-step -step process of, of um, I'm looking for the word all the time, uh, onderhandelen, um, verhandelen. I say yeah. this in that in English. Negotiation. Negotiation. Nego exactly. Negotiation between everyone that's involved. And and of course, this makes the, the result a compromise. It will never be this this big vision. Um, but we'll have to see how far we can get with the compromise. Yeah. Uh, that's maybe not this, exactly an answer on the question. No, but well, you can also answer in case you want, you can answer also in a written form later on, or we'll pick it up again. But I think just one thing, because we, we we have little time left, but I I see that uh, Elia is also mentioning, and that was an interesting remark that you made, that there's the idea of relocating the houses from random places to the cities, which are, you know, more in the outskirts of the cities. And then this could create big wastelands of expert areas. And on the other side also, of course, because it's building zones, unless you have a change in zoning, that these uh, waste, wastelands will be newly overbuilt. How do you relate to that? What's your opinion on this? Yeah, well, I touched it very shortly because I think it's very important to to mention it, but we, I, I can talk for an hour about it. We are not relocating houses. Yeah, houses are there and we're not going to, I mean, we're not destroying houses and, and moving people. There is absolutely no uh, no support for that in Flanders, politically and not societal. What we are focusing on is trying to remove building rights. That's already more than, more than complicated enough. So there are a lot of unbuilt parcels that have building rights that are on long, wrong locations. Um, within the Belgian zoning law or the Flemish zoning law, you can, you can change the destination of a piece of land, but then you have to pay the owner for that. You have to compensate him because he loses money because he cannot build the house there anymore. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you can give someone else um, uh, more uh, development rights uh, on an area that maybe he was not allowed to build. You can give him or her uh, building rights and then he has to pay you uh, to compensate for that. So in that way, you can, you can try to find a balance in between those two people. Uh, you can, the one that can build more can pay the other one that cannot build anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, in the end, it does not work so easily. So that's why why it's becoming complicated. So that's that's what we are looking at uh, how to do this. And also, the Flemish government is uh, is investigating this for a long term. What this will mean for the area where there are now the building plots? Well, I don't think they will be uh, uh, desolated wastelands in the way that <laughs> it's not going so fast at all. I mean, if if we are doing we are doing this step by step, and that's also why we have this uh, this strategy for the local villages in, uh, uh, included. What we just try to avoid is that they further grow too much. Um, yeah. And I th actually, I think they can have a perspective that is very uh, attractive, even um, as a small scale village on the countryside with beautiful nature around it. I think people will uh, uh, even like that. Right. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid of that. Um, yes. The problem is to get it realized, it's very, it's very complex. Yes, but I think such a regional spatial strategy as you're developing now in this process, as you said, it's a, it's a governance process. So that's the first step to avoid you know, the future mm -hmm. of urban sprawl and make a, make a change. And again, a behavioral change in how you plan and how you take decisions. And I think there's an interesting question, which I think I could just answer by yes, but uh, see it, you, you mentioned 
uh, this mobility backbone, backbone and the speed network on a larger scale, is that like a seen as a spine, as a as a background uh, plan to develop this region further, to have, as you mentioned before, these speed connections, but then also having feeding systems, you know, seeing it more as a whole network, just as we do also on the TNT corridor scale in the mega regional scale, but you do the same, you look at it also from a regional perspective, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, and then um, after seeing these interesting spatial maps that you produced also from Bühr, and you really, it's beautiful to see how research by design is made, do you have um, for Valeria more um, inspiring readings on visions and regional identity? And you also mentioned how important it is to create such a regional identity. I think we're definitely encountering the same problems and challenges in the Eurodelta network. We need this blueprint. We need these these maps. We need these these pillars of identity in order to create this network further. And you're doing the same thing on a regional scale in Leuven, you know, and your surrounding areas. So. Do you have more, I guess, on the website that you mentioned, right, that you sent to us, there's more? Well, there is more about this specific project. Okay. Um, I, I cannot say out of my head now uh, uh, examples, but I think definitely in the Netherlands and also in, in the west of Germany, there are many good examples. Uh, I think the Netherlands is really leading on that level, uh, having regional identities and working on regional planning. Uh, I think you if you Google a bit about the different provinces and the different regions there, you will find a lot of interesting material. And also in our handout on the Next Generation Podium, we have illustrated some approaches of different uh, of countries, areas, agglomeration concept in Germany, and also Dutch and Belgium approaches on, on these regional scalings and regional uh, plans. I have a, uh, an active uh, hands up from side. Please go ahead, follow up question maybe. Can you hear me? Yes, Hello. I can yeah, hear you. Hi. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for the lecture. It was really very informative. So uh, my question is like, uh, uh, when there is a planning which is done in, on different countries, for example, the core of focus for planning in Netherlands might be different what Germany is aiming for or, or any other country. So when, uh, how do we actually integrate these when these uh, when we talk about the uh, Yora Delta, because like in one of the illustrations uh, uh, of uh, the map, uh, there was a map where uh, there is a detailed bike network that will move from one city to another. But honestly, the way uh, Netherlands has been tackling it is way more different than Germany. So yeah. actually, I'm curious about how do they integrate these two where there is a planning focus change between the two countries. Yes, I think, uh, class, you could answer that, no? Because it's on your agenda between the Netherlands and and uh, uh, Germany, no? Also mobility, urban mobility, regional mobility, I think. Informally, it's being done, and we're trying to create formal planning or correlating the formal planning procedures and processes that are in place. But of course, it's more an informal managerial uh, step that is currently it's going on. actually. Um, thank you for the uh, for the question, uh, Siet. Um, the, the, keeping up to the uh, example of the bike lanes um, uh, between North Westphalia and the province of Overijssel or Gelderland, um, uh, this topic is raised in our working agenda. We have agreed upon on a, a political level in 2019, as I discussed, um, and there we said, well, this topic is one of the things we should work on to um, uh, create bike lanes that don't um, uh, cross along. Uh, I always uh, think of the uh, Mont Blanc tunnel um, uh, from France to Italy. To where do we bring these two tunnels together? Uh, the simple fact uh, in the um, uh, flat area of the, the, the border area of um, uh, uh, Overijssel and North Rhine-Westphalia has the same issue to tackle. And um, we know each other. Um, out of the network of the, um, uh, the, the working agenda, uh, it's a politically raised topic we should discuss about. Uh, so we have uh, uh, working um, uh, teams on both sides of the border that address the issue and discuss about which uh, uh, part to, to, to work on first and uh, what should be next uh, uh, and uh, or next years. Um, and then you discuss every detail if necessary. Um, uh, how wide should it be? Uh, where do we um, cross the border and how? Who should pay for what part? So you should address every aspect 
uh, and you should be aware of the um, uh, if every partner from both sides of the border is uh, committed to really step forward mm. and because of the working agenda uh, the dutch part the provinces are really committed to the uh, topics that are mentioned in the working agenda uh, as well as north Rhine westphalia is committed to step forward um, uh, and they are also just to, to intervene yeah. before running over time but they are also of course eu funding program programs exactly for these areas in place and this is also something that we're trying to also show on the Euro Delta map and highlight how many smaller EGTCs of cross-border collaboration in the sphere of mobility and bike lane uh, extensions are already in place. And I think it can only help if you see it in one area working well, like what's the replicability in another area as well. So that's, of course, it's a, it's a constant learning approach. But since we're already a bit over time, I need to ask you for a moment to please put all your videos up because we would like to have one rather a public image of, of what we're doing here so we can take a snapshot for our for our own evaluation and also publicity of what next generation is all about and then thank you very much